Satan. Charles Dix is the only one in charge. I'm on the road. I'm on the road. Evet, şöyle düşün. Mesela translation'da neyse burada lokalize parçacığın var diyelim ki. Bunu buradan alıyorsun, buraya taşıyorsun. Rotation'da şu diye burası origin'in senin. Şurada lokalize de olan bir parçacığın var. Bunu dönderdiğin zaman bu artık şurada lokalize. Yani atıyorum origin'in mesela şuradaysa şuradaki parçacığı alıyorsun, buraya götürüyorsun. Z ekseni eksi etrafında döndürürsem. O. Yani translation aslında aynı şey. Ama burada translate ettiğimiz, değiştirdiğimiz şey açılar. Uzunluklar değil. Ama zaten şurada da e, dikkat edersen burada zaten biraz şeyi kullandık. Okay, so here for example we use the fact that Rotations, at least infinitesimal rotations, are in a sense like translations. But how much you translate this delta r depends also on your position. It's not constant. Now that is kind of understandable because if you have a particle over here, if you localize it by an angle, if you rotate it by an angle theta, it is displaced by this much. If you have a particle over here, if you rotate it by the same angle, it is displaced by this much. A smaller amount. But at the end of the day, you can just think of rotations as uh, displacements, but the displacements depend on where you are. This object is displaced by this much, whereas this object is displaced by this much. So that's basically what we call the rotations. Or if you want, we use these Cartesian coordinates, x, y, and z, to denote a localized state, but we can also use r, theta, and phi to describe exactly the same state. It's a particle localized at, the, at that point over there. You can either use Cartesian coordinate system to specify that point, or a spherical coordinate system to specify exactly the same point. Now, if you look at rotations around the z-axis, By, let's say, by an angle phi, r theta phi, this is just, well, okay, so let me just uh, give it a different name. Let me call that gamma. If you rotate by gamma around the z-axis, its effect is only change phi to phi plus gamma. Initially it was here, now it is over there. Well, we can look also look at the wave functions. So let's see. Let's look at uh, r, theta, and phi multiplied with 1 minus i over h bar uh, delta phi lz. This is a rotation around the z-axis. I'm rotating my cat psi. This is equal to r theta phi psi minus i over h bar delta phi r theta phi lz of psi. This is equal to this matrix element is psi at r theta phi minus i over h bar delta phi r theta phi lz psi. Okay, this is one representation of that matrix element. But at the same time, this is nothing but r theta phi minus delta phi acting on psi. It's not plus this time. Just pay attention to he. If you look at over here, it is plus gamma. If you look at over here, it is minus delta phi. And the reason is that, you see, here I have a minus sign. 
and it is acting on the right. If I consider it to be acting on the left, I should take its dagger. That makes this a plus sign, but that is nothing but a rotation by an angle minus delta phi. That's why here I have a minus delta phi. And this is nothing but my wave function at the point R theta and phi minus delta phi. Well, I can consider a Taylor expansion, psi of R theta phi minus uh, or plus derivative of my wave function with respect to phi multiplied by minus delta phi. Now, I can just compare these two expressions, this one and this one. They are basically the same thing. So that tells me that R theta and phi LZ psi is nothing but I over H bar, no, H bar over I del over del phi R theta phi psi. So this is how, how I can show LZ operator in spherical coordinates. Now at the same time I also have well our theta phi is nothing but x, y, z. LZ was x, p, y minus y, p, x psi this is equal to h bar over i x del over del y minus y del over del x psi. And in fact, if you just take this operator, write it in spherical coordinates, you would just get h bar over i del over del phi. Now you can basically do the same thing for the Lx and Lz. Well, of course, it will be kind of the action of uh, uh, rotations around the x-axis on a given coordinate, or uh, on a given point, r theta, theta phi, will have a much more complicated expression, but at the end of the day, we basically do the same thing. Well, I will not <coughs> go over the derivations of that, but I will just write down what is L squared. Well, once you identify Lx, Ly, and Lz, in the spherical coordinates, you can just write what L squared is. Let's say R L squared psi. This is how what the L squared looks like in coordinate basis. This will be minus h bar squared 1 over sine squared theta del squared by del phi squared plus 1 over sine theta del over del theta sine theta del over del theta psi. At the point R. Well, this is kind of part of the Laplacian in spherical coordinates. Now, to actually show the uh, relation in more detail, you see we have L, we had defined it as R cross P. Now, what is L squared? This is epsilon ijk xj pk epsilon ilm xl pm in index notation. Let us just multiply them. If you multiply the two uh, Levi-Civita tensors, what you get is Kronecker delta jl, Kronecker delta km, minus Kronecker delta jm, Kronecker delta uh, kl. X J P K X L P M. Well, I'm just keeping the order fixed because they do not commute. 
XJPK. Well, I can change their order. You see, PK, XL. Now let me keep the order for the time being. This will be equal to XL, PM, XL, PM. This is the first term. Minus XM, PL, XL, PM. Well, let me just reorder some of those terms. Let's see, it will be nice if I just commute these two terms. So this is XL multiplied with XL PM plus commutator of PM and XL PM. So if you just open this up, this is PM XL minus XL PM. This XL PM cancels this XL PM. What I remains is the, this term above. So that's why I write it in that form. Minus, well, here I would like to do a couple of things. First, I want to commute these two. And then I want to commute XM all the way up to PM. So let us do it step by step. This is XM, XL, PL, plus PL, XL, PM. This is equal to, well, the first term is X squared, or R squared, in fact, R squared, P squared. That, that is the, my first term. This commutator is minus i h bar Kronecker delta ml. So I have minus i h bar r dot p minus x m x l p l p m plus i h bar r dot p, what is this commutator? p l x l is it true? I have a factor 3 there. Remember I am summing over l. l takes 3 values. So each one of them it is minus i h bar. So that's why I have a three. Well, almost done. So this is equal to L squared is equal to R squared P squared plus two i h bar R dot P minus x L Okay, one last step. This is PL XM plus the commutator of XM and PL. Multiplied with PM. R squared P squared plus 2i h bar r dot p minus r dot p squared this is i h bar Kronecker delta ml minus i h bar r dot p and finally l squared is equal to r squared p squared plus i h bar r dot p minus r dot p squared or p squared uh, which is nothing but the Laplacian if you like is 1 over l squared over r squared plus r dot p 
squared over r squared minus i h bar r dot p over r squared. Well, to obtain the Laplacian, the last step, let's look at the matrix elements. P squared psi r. On one hand, this is equal to minus h bar squared Laplacian of psi of r. This is the momentum operator. Now, on the other hand, let's, we have the other operators, which are, let's say, r, oh, sorry, r, r dot p, psi, this is r dot h bar over i times the gradient of psi, or h bar over i, r times the derivative with respect to the radial coordinate of psi. And then we have this uh, r dot p squared term. This is minus h bar squared r del over del r, r del over del r of psi. So now finally, the p uh, minus h bar squared, the Laplacian of psi, this is equal to, well, we have the L squared over R squared term, one over R squared times L squared acting on psi. Here, this L is the differential operator now. And now we have plus one over R minus h bar squared over r squared r del over del r r del over del r of psi minus i h bar over r squared times r dot p r dot p is h bar over i r del over del r of psi now, this is kind of our uh, kinetic energy. This will be our kinetic energy. How does the kinetic energy acts on my state? So minus h bar squared over 2m psi will be equal to, well, the, I can cancel one of these r's. This is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m. 1 over r, del over del r, r del over del r of psi, minus or plus 1 over r, del over del r of psi, plus 1 over h bar squared, l squared psi, over r squared psi. Okay, this is my, the kinetic energy. In terms of the angular momentum. Now we will look at spherical symmetric potentials. Well, if we have a spherical symmetric potential, the Hamiltonian is p squared over 2m plus v, which depends only on the radial coordinate. But if this is the case, then Hamiltonian and L squared, they commute, which is nice. So the uh, eigenstates we can just label them. They will have some energy, but they will also be a simultaneous eigenkets of 
L squared and also Lz. These are my eigenkets. Hamiltonian acting on this one will be E L and M. Hmm? Well, for a given value of L and M, it might be possible to have more than one energy eigenvalue. So that's why I have both E and L and M. Not really. I mean, degeneracy will be uh, different values of M. You see, for example, will there be degeneracy? You see, Hamiltonian commutes with J plus and minus. which tells me that J plus minus E L M if I act on this with the Hamiltonian I will get E J plus minus E L M so this is definitely not equal to E L M but still it has the same energy So, for a given value of L, different values of M will, should have exactly the same energy. That is degeneracy. But for a given value of L and M, I can have different states having different energies. This is not degeneracy. Because I'm talking about different energy levels. we see that there is at least some degeneracy due to the possible values of M. Now, there is no operator that, at least no apparent operator that relates different values of L and commutes with the Hamiltonian. So that tells me that different values of L, in general, they can have different energies. You see, here I have these operators J plus and J minus, that relate different values of M. And they commit with the Hamiltonian. So since J plus and J minus, they change the value of M and commit with the Hamiltonian, these different values of M should correspond exactly to the exactly the same energy. That's where the degeneracy comes into the game. But there is no, at least no apparent operator that relates different values of L. So they can have different energies. So if you go back to over here, well, we have this Ketz E L M. I can write the wave functions psi r, which what I will do is I will just consider is angular momentum just changes the core angles. It doesn't change the radius. So this I can write as psi of r, which will be a function of e, and possibly also l and m in general, and some function that depends only on the angles. Well, basically what I'm doing over here is I'm taking this ket I'm writing this as this one. I'm separating the radial dependence and the uh, theta and phi dependence. And this Lm, oh, I can do basically the same thing for my energy eigenket. Well, this energy piece might, in principle, depend on the L and M values times 
the LM kit. Now this LM kit is overlap with theta and phi is what I call YLM. Theta and phi. Now what are these theta and phi? I can actually calculate them. You see, I already know, for example, theta and phi L, LZ LM this is on one hand, this is equal to h bar times m, theta and phi, l and m. On the other hand, it, I already know how lz looks in coordinate basis. This is equal to h bar over i, del over del phi, theta phi, l m. So y l m in terms of phi at least satisfy this equation, h bar over i, del over del phi, y l m, this is equal to h bar m, y l m. <coughs> or y l m should be proportional to e to the power minus i m phi, now plus i m phi with a proportionality constant that depends only on theta. Now, what is that f theta? <coughs> well, we can construct also them, if you like. Let's start with LL. I know that L plus acting on LL should be zero. But you can just work out the, what the L plus does in the uh, spherical way, coordinates. If you just work, work it out, you will get minus i h bar e to power i phi plus i del by del theta minus cotangent theta del over del phi Y L L. This should be equal to zero. So this allows you to determine what Y L L should be. Well, once you have Y L L, you can just act on Y L L by L minus to obtain the other spherical harmonics for a given value of L. So you can just build all of them if you like. Now let's go back to our shooting. Well, any questions on this one? Well, let's go back to our Schrodinger equation. Now, h is equal to p squared over 2m plus v of r. Now, the Hamiltonian acting on this energy eigenstate will be equal to well, I already know what the piece, how the p squared acts. This is minus this one. Of course, now I have the potential term also. Well, on this state, I know the action of L squared. So this is equal to minus h bar squared over 2m, 1 over r del by del r, r d over dr psi, plus 1 over r d over dr of psi, plus L, L plus 1, 
over r squared psi there is this additional minus h bar squared over 2m plus v of r of psi this should be equal to e of psi this is my eigenvalue equation only in the radial coordinate now let me do one more step let me write psi r theta and phi as some radial function over r times ylm I already used the fact that it is proportional to ylm but I'm also writing the radial part as some, radial, some function that depends on, only on the radial coordinate divided by r. So when I take the derivatives, del psi over del r is, let's say, r prime r over r minus r over r squared ylm. r times del psi over del r is r prime minus capital R over small r ylm. I need to take another derivative. This will be equal to r double prime minus r prime over r plus r over small r squared ylm. And if you look at what I need, now let me split it. So, now Hamiltonian acting on Psi is now minus h bar squared over 2m well 1 over r r double prime minus r prime over r plus r over r squared plus 1 over r the derivative with respect to r once is r prime over r minus r over r squared plus 1 over uh, L times L plus 1 over R squared R plus V of R times R. All of this is multiplied with YLM. Should be equal to E times capital R times YLM. Okay, now let's, see, let's look at the cancellations, if there are any. Here I have minus r prime over r squared. Here I have plus r prime over r squared. They just cancel. Here I have plus r over r cubed. Here minus r over r cubed. They also cancel. So what I am left with? Oh, sorry. Here I have r over small r, r over small r. Well, on both sides I have YLMs. I can multiply both sides by r, so this cancel this one, this one, and this one. I am left with this equation, minus h bar squared over 2m, r double prime, minus h bar squared over 2m, l, l plus 1, plus v of r, multiplying r, this should be equal to e of r. But this is nothing but the one-dimensional Schrodinger equation. 
So with this rep replacement, if we choose the Psi as R of R over R Y L M, then this R, this function R, to satisfy the ordinary one-dimensional Schrodinger equation with a slight modification. I have a sign mistake somewhere though. This should be plus. Well, that term is nothing but our uh, centripetal barrier. You see, for example, in classical physics, if you have a particle zero angular momentum and finite energy it can never reach the origin so if you have let's say this particle you now if you start an object from rest Let's say you have an attractive potential at this point. If you start a particle at rest, of course it has zero angular momentum it, and it will eventually fall in, at your origin. But if you, if you have a particle that has a small angular momentum, what will it do is it will just approach the origin. If you start from here, it will approach the origin. It will never be able to reach the origin. It will be an elliptical orbit. It will never, if you look at the radial distance, the radial distance changes between some minimum value. If it is some minimum value determined by the angular momentum. Well, depending on the energy, it can go to infinity or it can just uh, have a bounded orbit, but the critical thing is classically it will never be able to reach the origin. Well, that is basically what this term does. You see, if you just call this whole thing as your effective potential, this is the effective potential also in uh, classical physics. V effective will have such a shape. This is for V of R is equal to minus alpha over R. But this increase in the potential is given by this L, L plus 1 over R squared term. So here uh, I have an H bar squared and no H bar squared over here. So this is exactly the classical expression of the effective potential in the one-dimensional analog. Now we, we can look at how, the wave how the, it affects the wave function itself. So at small separations, you see, this diverges. This is finite. E is finite. If Vr doesn't diverge as bad as this one, my, this function R should satisfy this equation.
This is when the, at small distances, this is the equation that my capital R should satisfy independent of the energy. Well, I can solve this asymptotic form of the differential equation. Let's see, let's look for a solution of this form. Okay, that is also something I should, okay, so let's, let's I mean, okay, I, I will check in the notes. So that should be an h bar squared also there. Let's look at for a solution of this form, r to the alpha. Now, if you just put it over here, you will get minus h bar squared over 2m times alpha, alpha minus 1 times r to the alpha plus h bar squared over 2m l, l plus 1 r to, now here alpha minus 2, r to the alpha minus 2 should be equal to 0. Well, r to the alpha minus 2's, they cancel. This h bar squares over 2m's, they cancel. So we get l times l plus 1 minus alpha times alpha minus 1. This should be equal to 0. This is our equation. So this tells me that Either alpha should be equal to L plus 1, or alpha is equal to minus L. So I have two solutions, basically. R of R divided by cap small r. This is my wave function. This, should, this can have some dependence like R to the L plus B over R to the L plus 1. Now, you see, the second term diverges, so it won't give us a solution that is normalizable at the origin. The normalization integral will diverge because of its behavior at the origin. So that's not a normalizable solution. Now, another problem with this approach would be, let's look at the probability current, the radial probability current density. You see, if you remember, this was proportional to the real part of psi star now, this is the real part of psi star gradient psi. This is the probability current. If you want the radial part, you just take this uh, scalar product with the radial vector. And this just becomes, let's see, r hat dot, now let me write it in a different form. This is the real part of psi star times the radial derivative of psi. Now, if you look at the B part, the term containing the B, this will be B squared times L plus 1. Well, let's say this, there will be a minus sign over here. So this will be plus B squared L plus 1, 1 over R to the power 2L plus 1 plus other terms I will have. Just put in the number. It should be minus h bar over 2m, etc. Now, what this tells me, there is a, if b is non-zero, let's just imagine a very small sphere at the origin. There is a probability flow out of that very small sphere. But in this very small sphere, the, if the wave function is normalizable, the probability of my particle to be in this very small sphere is negligible. But still there is a flow out of this sphere, which cannot be. So that's basically why the, a second reason why this B term should be zero. So we already knew that B term doesn't give us a normalizable solution. That is one thing. The second problem is this one because that B term gives me a probability flow out of the origin, a single point. But there's, there cannot be uh, any total probability of my particle to be exactly at the origin should be zero. There cannot be a flow from the origin. So B term is absent. And hence, basically this tells me that whatever my potential is, my wave function is, has this form, r to the power L, 
y l m theta and phi as r goes to zero. Now again, if l is non-zero, this tells me that the, my wave function at the origin has to be zero. My, my particle cannot reach the origin if it has a finite angular momentum. This is also what we also know from classical physics. Now, this is one asymptotic form of my wave function. Now we can look at the other extreme. Okay, this is my Schrodinger, my radial equation. We already know how my wave function behaves for very small distances. Now what about very large distances? Well, here there should be an h-bar. How does it behave at very large distances when r goes to infinity? Well, you see, at r goes to infinity, we can look for potentials that go to zero. V of r goes to zero. One over r squared term goes to zero. This term will also go to zero. So at infinity, minus h bar squared over 2m, r double prime, should be equal to e of r. For a bound state, that's a state that is localized around some region, which doesn't go to infinity, e should be less than zero, the total energy of my system, should be less than the, the value of the potential energy at infinity, so I can define, let's say, kappa to be square root of minus 2me over h bar squared. So my radial function goes as, as r goes to infinity, e to power minus kappa r. Now I know how my wave function behaves. Basically, at r is equal to, close to r is equal to zero, it should have this form. At very far away distances, it should have this form. And of course, it can have, I mean, some arbitrary function multiplying those asymptotic forms, and then we have the y elements. And this f of r goes to zero as r, well, Go, not doesn't go to zero, it, it can go to a constant value. Because the asymptotic values of a constant, uh, Asymptotic values are already given by r to the l or e to the power minus kappa r or kappa r. So the next thing that will be what is this f of r? And of course, it will depend on which kind of potential we have. And that is what we will do on Wednesday. Any questions? Well, we will not be doing perturbation theory or perturbation theory this semester. Most of these rotation analysis, they will be used when we, are discuss when we will be discussing rotations, uh, scattering or perturbation theory. So you see, because you will be adding perturbations that will still conserve the angular moment. Questions? Okay, so on Wednesday we will continue. Next week we will also continue a bit. How are your finals? When are your, do you have finals on Monday or Wednesday?